I'm Cheryl. I'm the head of venture growth and partnerships here. Uh, and I'm also an investment partner of Community Fund. Uh, I've been here for about three years, uh, making sure that we uh, see not only uh, amazing diverse founders on the investment team, but then also throughout the company. So very excited to be here. And just for everyone to know, Republic is essentially a platform where anyone can invest in startups. Um, we actually spun out of AngelList in 2016 after Title III of Jobs Act passed that allowed non-accredited investors to invest. So for those of you who weren't so familiar about um, accreditation status, so essentially if you, before, if you had a net worth of over $200,000, sorry, over a million dollars or income over 200K a year, you were considered an accredited investor. And then if you didn't have the, or didn't meet those requirements, then you were a non-accredited investor. This Title III of the Jobs Act really allowed anyone to invest. And so now we are about 1 million members strong, which is very exciting. In the past five years, we've grown and then really invested $150 million in 250 uh, companies and, and growing actually. So really excited about that. Today's agenda is going to be about investment thesis 101. Then it's also going to be about creating your own investment thesis. And last but not least, thinking about startup key signals. So let's start with investment thesis. What is an investment thesis, right? An investment thesis is a unique idea that you've developed about a topic, whether it's an industry, sector, geographical location, business model, or even a specific startup. It can also speak to your overall investment strategy as an investor and is based on research and analysis that you conduct. Naturally, based on your perspective, these ideas can be expansive and broad. It can be contrarian to popular beliefs and or, or highly specific to a single element. Lastly, your investment thesis should grow with you as you learn more about your chosen topics. Markets evolve, as you can tell, the pandemic <laughs> was something no one saw coming. And therefore you really have to um, be adaptable and these trends, new trends emerge that may either contradict or support your investment thesis. So pitiful element is really that you react with new information and evolve and adjust accordingly. So some key questions. So at the bottom of the slide, you see some key questions. Who are you investing in? Why? What is your hypothesis? How is it unique? What supporting evidence do you have? And then what supporting evidence do you need? And then why is your investment thesis right as compared to other op opinions, right? Why hasn't this been done before? And why would companies want you as an investor <laughs> or what value could you add? So if you go to the next slide, why do you need an investment thesis, right? Why are we talking about this thing of like, hmm, your hypothesis? Um, it's because it really kind of becomes your North star if you think about it as an investor, right? Deploying your dollars, going on to Republic, understanding, okay, like there's all these options, you know, where do I go? What do I do? This is where your investment thesis really helps. So it allows you to focus your thoughts on a single idea and uh, it can apply your efforts to source opportunities to invest in later on too, right? You stay disciplined and concentrated on your investment objectives. You'll, you'll also develop quality deal flow if this is something that you wanna be more into um, from other investors, if, especially if you brand yourself as like the person um, that is the expert in a certain investment area. And by creating an investment thesis, you can really refine your skill set. Um, you work more as a focused investor. And this can be used internally, right? You can regulate your own investment theses, but they can also be published via Medium, Twitter, um, to really share with others and facilitate conversations. And your thesis will essentially serve as your game plan. That's what we ask everyone to do when they're, you know, seeing all these companies and all these opportunities that we offer you like that. That's, that's the Republic give, right? Is that we take it upon ourselves to see thousands and thousands of applications a year to make sure that you see all of the amazing opportunities. It's up to you to then go ahead and take all of these opportunities, filter them based on your investment thesis, and then go and invest. An amazing example actually is of a venture capital firm called Union Squared Ventures. Um, this is essentially how their investment thesis has adapted over time, right? So from 2007, 2010, there were basically, they said that they were focused on 
large networks of engaged users differentiated through user experience and defensible through network effects. So they focused on startups like Etsy and Twitter. Then it shifted, right? Especially with the recession and as markets matures, we look for a less obvious network effect. So more about infrastructure for a new economy. And in 2011 to 2019, then USB changed again and focused more on enabling trusting brands to broaden access to knowledge, capital, and well-being by net leveraging networks, platforms, and protocols. Basically, an investment thesis is an effective way for any investor to refine their ideas and synthesize changes in new ways. Zara? Yeah, so now we're going to talk about how do you even begin to create your own investment thesis. First and foremost, you should notice the kinds of startups that you're personally interested in. This is a great place to start noticing what types of companies interest you, aggregate them together. Are they mostly Gen Z focused, consumer, fintech, location focused? These are all questions that you can begin to ask yourself. When you start to think about this, you should also think about the consistencies you notice in the startups you most resonate with. Once you notice that consistency, you should begin to conduct your initial research. Um, next slide, Cheryl. Establish the industry and dive deep into research. Read up on articles that discuss the industry's trajectory in the future and the history that led up to this point. Moreover, analyze what other VCs and investors are saying about the industry and reflect on what you can add to those conversations. Ensure that this research supports your unique perspective. Stay away from regurgitation of other people's opinions. Research is to inform you and substantiate your perspective, not to fully emulate that of others. Now, you need to consolidate this key information into a report. You should start with opening the, with the overarching trends that you see in a particular industry, then list the macro and micro assumptions about the industry at large. Write your thesis statement. Illustrate your unique understanding of the industry. Highlight all of your supporting evidence and insights. Emphasize how every single statement of evidence you list supports your unique opinion. Choose your evidence carefully. Don't dump everything that you find online in there. List startups that fit into the investment thesis. These could be proving that your thesis will come true in the future or that your thesis is happening right now. Another aspect to list would be startups with similar capabilities in tangential industries. Each piece in the investment thesis and the report should work towards illustrating that your thesis leads to a future investment opportunity. To dive into each of these in greater detail, particularly initial research, there are certain steps you should be taking. Let's say you can't necessarily find a pattern that emerges from the companies you're interested in. How can you kickstart idea generation? Do something you already have experience with. Was it a startup you interned at, gave advice to, know someone who works at one, know a lot about its industry? Someone you are in something or someone that you identify with or you're inherently passionate about. These could be community driven perspectives of, as well, which have become increasingly popular. Think if you think you have a unique idea about the future, that can also 100% be an investment thesis and idea to focus on. Now that you've refined the focus of your thesis, market research is pivotal. You need to both quant you need both quantitative and qualitative data about the industry to really add to a holistic perspective of your thesis. You should utilize resources like PitchBook for market reports, information on private companies, Crunchbase for business information on public and private companies, and Statista for market sizing. Now that we've told you what each of these elements entails and what the structure should look like, let's take a moment to put this into practice and I'll let Cheryl take over. Sorry, I could not find the mute button for a second. So when I actually, um, and by the way, please put all your questions in the chat. Uh, we are going to look at it after we present and then we'll answer some accordingly or if we have time after Randy's uh, conversation. So just wanted to let you guys know too that we will be sharing some of these slides as well and, and we'll have this on our YouTube channel. So stay tuned. So here we have overarching trends, beliefs and assumptions, the thesis breakdown, supporting evidence, and our hypothetical picks, right? Um, this is a really just kind of clean way of showcasing, you know, how we think about a certain, uh, you know, trend industry and creating our own investment thesis. And so I chose Republic <laughs> because it's the easiest one, I think, for everyone to understand and for folks to really kind of synthesize how you should think about your own investment thesis. So in terms of overarching trends, right? 
there are four trends that I think are key in terms of Republic's rise, right? The first one is that there's a move of consumers who are starting to become owners, right? They're trying, they're realizing, you know, Beyonce said, pay me in equity. <laughs> and so people are saying the same thing too, right? They want to have equity in brands that they care about. Two, founders actually want to harness the power of community because that is something where more and more people want to have those brand evangelists to really be part of their success and have them enter at the ground floor of what they're building. The third would be diversifying the portfolio, right? A lot of investors like you guys, right, want to diversify their portfolios, especially since the public markets are going up and down. Like it was, especially during the pandemic, it was called the kangaroo market because it literally was going up and down every single day. And then last but not least is alternative assets right? NFTs, you know, buying art and, you know, get, uh, making sure that, you know, people are trying to find yield in different areas now. And the fact that you can um, is something where more and more people are starting to explore that further. In terms of beliefs and assumptions, there are a couple of things that have helped, right? COVID tailwinds made everyone stay at home. <laughs> and so everyone was now looking for new ways to, you know, maximize the most out of their money and you know make sure that they they kept their money instead of lost it during the time that was you know so so fraught with change the second was the community will continue to be a defensible mode because as technologies converge there's more and more of a need to bring in your community into what you're building and then last but not least the assumption really here is that you know gen z's and the you know people of the future and even you know millennials like folks that currently have money will want to make that money go into things that they believe in causes they believe in and people that they want to support and so that's really kind of that change that i think will permeate throughout um you know for years to come the thesis breakdown is really pretty simple <laughs> the private markets will continue to be democratized as technologies allow anyone to invest um and so the supporting evidence is really you know the rise of community Glossier, Peloton, you know, they had different products, right? But they weren't the only products in the market, right? What made them really special was the fact that they had a community around it from day one. Second, the NFT movement, obviously is a supportive evidence here is that more and more folks are trying to support their creators early on. And at the same time, they're trying to, you know, understand how they could potentially profit out of this. And last but not least, retail investors are starting to wake up at the fact that these are all options for them. And so we see that just at Republic, right, in terms of our growth, in terms of how much we want, you know, how many RSVPs we have for this uh, class. And so that's our hypothetical pick is Republic because I'm biased, but that's kind of how you want to think about creating your investment thesis. Sarah? Yeah, so going back to this discussion on how to really bring about your investment theses, we do want to start with um, focusing on the fact that constant reevaluation is key. While it's vital to start out with a great level of detail in your analysis of the market and substantive evidence, you need to be keeping up with trends, news, and startups that could be revolutionizing that space. You need to be thinking about how you're going to adapt to all of this news. The macro events in focus are new industry trends, regulatory changes, demographics expanding or contracting, who the customer is, and the ever-changing competitive landscape. Um, next slide, Cheryl. Perform a sanity check when assessing how your investment thesis performs. What are the current market trends? Is the industry getting too competitive? Are these new trends something to capitalize on? And how bad is bad news? The biggest question here is whether or not your thesis still holds. Don't be afraid to drop a thesis and discover a new one. The main point of focus is to use the news to adjust and be realistic about how this news impacts your thesis. If you need to start from scratch, we've presented a process that you can use to do so. However, for the most part, your thesis being completely disproven will rarely occur. In this case, it's most important to keep the long game in mind and keep your game plan as your main focus. Most importantly, don't get overwhelmed by the current news or lose sight of your thesis. As long as your thesis holds up, everything else is just noise. Next slide. We're going to be briefly um, discussing the startup key signals that you should be informed about when you're looking at a startup and attempting to qualify it. We're going to be focusing on team management, company fundamentals, traction, and financials. So first up is team and management. As I'm sure you've heard, a founding team is pivotal to consider when assessing a company. You should be looking at founder fit. Is there a clear delineation between the founder's background and the startup? 
Do they have a deep industry knowledge or have they recruited others on the team who do? What's the leadership style? You should be looking for a leader who clearly executes and is an effective planner. Can you find out anything about the team culture? Is it a collaborative environment? Are the missions and goals of the company long-term clear amongst the team? And most importantly, if there are co-founders, what is their relationship? Do their skill sets align? Can you tell that they work well together? These are a few questions you should be considering when looking at a team or a management group, but what's most important is that you adapt based on what the startup or the sector is. So moving to company fundamentals, this is where we begin to introduce some of the key VC vocabulary you should brush up on. Is there a product market fit? Um, what's the compelling evidence? Cheryl, could we go to the next slide? Um, that the product is built in a way that addresses existing demand. What's the competitive edge? How is the business model set up? Is it strategic? Who are the channel partners? What's the go-to-market beyond the initial product launch? And most importantly, what are the barriers to entry? They should be high. The founders should have navigated the space and leveraged on certain strengths to enter the market. All of this to say, it should not be easy for another company to completely replicate what the founder and the team have built. Moving on to the next slide, traction brings to the surface the important analytical points to keep in mind. What are the unit economics? LDV to CAC ratio, four to one is considered healthy contribution margins. What's the engagement rate? Three to 6% is considered high engagement for apps and websites. What's the retention rate? 25 to 35% is good traction, but this can vary from industry to industry. That's where your expertise and research comes into play. What's the DAU or the MAU? This um, indicates strong Sorry, uh, daily daily active users and monthly yeah. active users. <laughs> FYI, we're gonna yeah, we're gonna be sending some more information around all this, but just wanted to throw some of these things out there because there is some lingo around it, yeah. and especially um, in some of our you know campaign pages, there will be like LTV CAC, and so just yeah. really understanding a little uh, you know those acronyms further would be re like really helpful in making sure that that you make the right decisions. Yeah, and we can really, we can send you links that go into greater detail about what each of these acronyms mean. You'll find throughout the presentations, there are a lot of different um, acronyms that describe this. So again, when you're analyzing each of the companies, this is really useful, especially for startups that don't charge in the beginning, if you're thinking about apps or platforms to essentially measure the performance of each of these companies. While we've noted, examples here speaking to industry experts who have a better sense of what metrics might look like is another strategy to brush up on for traction so moving on to financials this is where you're going to be focusing on revenue burn rate and the balance sheet there's naturally more but we think this is a good starting point for revenue you're looking for a robust and repeatable high growth top line revenue whether it's recurring or not for the burn rate you should be looking for the money spent on productivity and growth instead of putting out fires this accelerates monthly revenues while decreasing monthly burn. Lastly, make sure that the balance sheet indicates a strong cash position. When looking at a sector of an industry, there are macro signals to consider in your research. At the sector level, what's the size of the industry, stage of the industry, scale of trends? What is the ability to leverage on market trends? At a subsector level, what's the market size? Can the size of the market share be captured? Who are the competitors and who is the market leader? How much has been de-risked? Moving on to the next slide, we do kind of want to discuss um, a focus on pattern recognition and somewhat- This is the biases, by the way. A lot yeah. of times VCs, they had mentioned something called pattern recognition. Yeah. And, you know, it's the stats show, right? 2% of women founders get funded, you know, so most the same for, you know, POC folks. And that is something that you always need to be mindful of. Um, and really making sure that, you know, you take all of these, you know, macro key signals, right, about, you know, at the high level and then digging further, but you always want to make sure that, you know, as you filter, is it efficient filtering or is it intellectual laziness? And there's, you know, a couple of different quotes here you can read yourself, um, but we just want to be clear that, you know, always check yourself as, as you analyze things, make sure you're checking yourself and seeing, okay, are the same people that, you know, I'm seeing, like, are, are the same types of people being benefited by how I'm thinking? Or is this something where I should be more open-minded about different things or take another look when it comes to a 
startup that you know might be in the Midwest versus you know an SF, right? Or you know might have uh, just different uh, ecosystems around it to support it, right? Um, it's really around making sure that you know you definitely look at some of these rules and these uh, kind of uh, markers that we've been setting up for you, but at the same time making sure that you know you are uh, taking your own knowledge, your experiences and being holistic around the valuation of a company to make sure that you know you come to the best conclusion. Um, so yeah, critical evaluation is just really key for all deals and it'll be different for every single one of you guys. But that's what we want, right? We want everyone to bring their own experiences and have millions of people look at these companies so that they could get funded. Cool, <laughs> awesome. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Zara, that was incredible. And um, I now leave it up to you. This is all good, by the way. Um, and just FYI, I think we have about one or two minutes if you want to tackle some of these questions, which, by the way, it seems like you guys are helping each other out, which is incredible. <laughs> so please do more of that. Um, I think that's awesome. If you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, want to make sure that uh we we get to your questions later so put them in the chat we'll try to answer them as we go along um and yeah then zara uh up to you yeah thank you guys so much for asking all of your questions in the chat we really appreciate how involved everyone has been and so now we're really excited to jump into the next part of this presentation, which is a conversation with Randy Zuckerberg. I highly recommend everyone, you're all using the chat already to express your opinions, but I also recommend using the chat to put in your questions and your thoughts. We have a Q&A function as well, so that would be a better place to aggregate your questions directed to Randy. But um, if you have thoughts, again, feel free to keep using the chat. But I'm super excited to welcome Randy Zuckerberg. I'm just going to do a brief introduction, and I'm sure she can dive into a lot of this more herself. But Randy Zuckerberg is an entrepreneur, investor, best-selling author, and Emmy-nominated tech media personality. She's the founder and CEO of Zuckerberg Media, with the mission of supporting current and future entrepreneurs through investment, mentorship, and media. The focus of these conversations is essentially on the steps to becoming an investor. And I think personally, a vital element of that is learning from the careers of accomplished people, which Randy definitely is. We're so excited to have her and I can't wait to get this conversation started. Randy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm here, but for some reason I can't turn my video on. It's saying the host has stopped my video. So that's odd. Let me try and <laughs> <laughs> Yay, technology. Yep. <laughs> Cheryl, do you know how we can get that addressed? Co-host now. Okay, great. It should be. Oh, here to I am. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, I'm super thrilled to be here and thank you. And I caught the end of that last presentation and wow, I, I was frantically taking notes also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are really excited to start this series off. And I feel like you're an incredible first person to start these conversations with, given that you've had such a robust career and there's so much to learn from you. And so just to kind of speak to the structure, I think we'll take 20 to 15 minutes having a back and forth conversation. And then I'll go through the Q&A and we'll answer questions or let you answer questions until the time is up. But would love to just kind of start with reflecting back on your career. What do you think were the moments that were most pivotal in your journey and have helped shape who you are now? Oh gosh. Well, and first of all, I just want to say that thank you for all the earring love in the chat. I have three young kids. I think this is the first time that I've gotten dressed up in a year. So I couldn't <laughs> imagine a better, uh, awesome group to, to actually put on a fun pair of earrings and, and hang out with today. So thank you for, for all the love. And uh, it, it's nice to kind of feel like normal life is coming back in again. Um, you know, I've had such a strange and crazy career because I have to admit that my dream in life was to sing on Broadway. And so naturally I found myself in Silicon Valley as one does when you want to be an actress with your life. Um, and I, I kind of thought that I had given up on that dream 
um, mm -hmm. which, which made me a little sad, but I was on this incredible rocket ship adventure with, with Facebook. And even to back up a little, I'd worked at a marketing agency in New York City. Um, I got staffed on this brand new team in 2003 called Digital Marketing. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that I had hit a dead end in my career. No one knew what digital marketing was. All my friends were supporting celebrities on fancy campaigns. Um, and then two years later, digital marketing had taken off in such a big way that I was running this team and all my friends were still getting coffee on, on television sets. Um, and that was about, that was when my brother called and said, Hey, um, I have this little project called the Facebook and I could really use someone who knows digital marketing and will work for free because we're a little <laughs> startup. And I was like, Oh, all right, sure. Um, I thought I was going out to California for one week to give him advice. And I ended up staying for a decade, um, which is an in incredible ride. Um, but I re I started at the end of that to really think um, about everything inside my soul that I had shelved with my love of the arts and performance and mm -hmm. theater. And I can't, I've been literally out of the blue. I got a call from the producers of a Broadway musical, Rock of Ages, an 80s rock musical, saying they wanted a tech personality to come uh, appear in their Broadway show. And so a decade after giving up on my dream and having this wild rocket ship ride in Silicon Valley, I mm -hmm. actually moved back to New York and starred on Broadway after all. So it's been kind of a, a, a crazy career um, of both kind of tech and theater, um, but it has all led me to the same place back to um, really thinking in my own life, who are entrepreneurs, how to invest in them, how to support mm -hmm. creators and artists and, and entrepreneurs from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's so fascinating to hear about the different industries you've touched throughout your career. And though I'm really young and have not even graduated from Columbia yet, I totally resonate with everything that you've kind of highlighted. And I think it's so great to look up to people who have careers that have expanded across different fields and different industries and sectors. And so obviously in our introduction of you, we've mentioned all the things you've accomplished and you're a powerhouse who has excelled in so many fields. And I'd love to kind of just hear about what it has been like scaling different businesses and measuring success across each of those businesses. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I feel lucky to have my hand in so many different types of businesses and industries, mm -hmm. because I think, you know, we, we fall into this pattern in this country. When we think of an entrepreneur, we get a certain mm -hmm. vision in our head of, mm -hmm. you know, like a young guy in a tech startup. And I feel so lucky in my career that um, about 80% of the founders that I have supported are mm -hmm. women and diverse founders. I have supported a lot of artists who I think are incredible entrepreneurs in the, in the theatrical mm -hmm. space and beyond. And so um, for me, my definition of scaling a company um, mm -hmm. applies to artists, it applies to, to all kinds of people. But um, you know, there are a lot of things that I look for when making an investment. Um, on the theatrical side, I've actually now invested in seven different Broadway shows and, and done a lot uh, on, on the producing side there. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, for me, that's actually a really fun one because you get data every single night. You know exactly how many tickets are sold. You know exactly how the show is performing. Whereas I find sometimes with the tech companies, it's a little mm -hmm. fuzzier. You make an investment and then maybe you don't hear from the founder for six months or a year, or you don't know, you know, the valuations are, are kind of fuzzy. And so I appreciate having the opportunity to scale both companies that um, are high growth tech, but also, you know, smaller companies where you're getting a lot of data and you know exactly what your growth strategy is every day. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I really enjoy playing in both those worlds. For sure. And I think you kind of touched on this uh, in your last answer, but you're an expert in media. And I think it's really interesting to think how over the last few years, there's been such a drastic change in the way that it's used. And even hearing you say that digital marketing at one point was something nobody understood. I feel like that's just a testament to how much the world has changed and media particularly. And so I'd love to hear how um, through your career, you've really seen like media and digital marketing shift. And I guess, particularly in the startup world or in the investing world, uh, what have you really seen change? 
Absolutely. Well, I mean, gosh, yeah. First of all, like you said, digital marketing did not even exist as an industry. <laughs> um, and when I went out to, to Silicon Valley, first of all, nobody even used their real names online in 2003, 2004. And I know that's crazy to think about now, but uh, back in those days, people were scared to put their real names and identities online. So they used screen names, they used mm -hmm. handles. If you ever speak with anyone who used AOL Instant Messenger, which was like the OG <laughs> chat, no one used their real name on, on anything like that. And so um, Facebook really pioneered the use of real name identity online. And because mm -hmm. of that, that is why now, you know, almost 20 years later, you feel comfortable climbing in someone else's car who picks you up for a ride or renting a room in someone else's house. Like these are not things that would have happened before there was a real name identity shift mm -hmm. online. Yeah. So I think that to me was one of the biggest um, shifts that's happened in the last 15 years. And that has opened up so many new categories of companies out there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also, you know, for me, I'm really excited in the past, you know, several years about the real focus on female and diverse founders. When yeah. I got out to Silicon Valley, I kid you not, I was the only woman in every room that I was in for a decade. I used to joke with people that my competitive advantage was that Randy is a guy's name. And so I'd, <laughs> I'd email people and they thought they were emailing with a dude. And oh I'd God. show up, you know, with my earrings and everything. And they'd be like, where's your boss, Randy? And I was like, sucker. And like, that was literally my business competitive advantage, which is funny and terribly sad. Um, things have gotten better, especially in the recent years. I mean, I remember a time in when I first got to Silicon Valley that there mm -hmm were basically no female investors at the institutional level. I mean, like could now today, I mean, it looks really poorly on a venture capital firm if they don't have a female investor uh, lead partner. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But that wasn't the case even only 15 years ago. You know, there's still so much work that needs to be done in this space, but I'm, I'm hopeful at, at some of the changes that I'm seeing. Yeah, for sure. I I think again like it's so important and to hear how it's improved and also like I guess that there's still steps to be made in this whole space in general I think it's really great because the program I run with Cheryl obviously Cheryl and I are both women of color and the Republic Venture Fellows and Associates are 80 percent people of color and so I feel like we do programs like this to address that change and I think it's really um, great to hear that you're an ally across the board. And I feel like it's such a inspiring part of your career to know that you've literally been advocating for this for like years leading up to this point. Um, and I guess now shifting gears to more advice giving, a lot of the people we have attending this panel right now are looking to become VCs or investors and naturally Republic gives them the <laughs> possibility to do so. And we're really kind of laying down the foundational terms uh, that really go into being a VC or being an investor. And so I guess from your perspective, what is your guiding advice for young people who want to build out their business acumen or investing perspective and skill set? First of all, I just want to say it is, it's incredible to hear that everyone here wants to get into investing because um, when you invest in, in the future that you want to see, I mean, mm -hmm. you have no idea even how just a little investment unlocks a snowball effect in the world. You know, if every mm -hmm. single one of us kind of invested, you know, opened up our wallets to make political change and social change through mm -hmm. investing, suddenly you're changing the very face of what entrepreneurship looks like in this country. You are changing who gets hired by those companies, you are changing who gets access to general wealth, generational wealth and then turns mm -hmm. around and puts that into their communities. So first of all, I, I think it's, it's incredible. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm really glad that you mentioned kind of some of the disparity around people of color getting investment, mm -hmm. because that's one of the things that really makes me still sit so uneasy about venture capital right now. I mean, first of all, less than, I think it's less than 6% of all venture capital goes to women in general, mm -hmm. which is atrocious, but really that's white women 
that 6% of venture capital goes to. And when you look at women of color, I think it's less than half a percent of venture capital yeah. is going there. And that is not something that any of us should feel proud of the industry. And, and that is certainly a, a huge area of opportunity. And that is where all of us come in. I mean, mm -hmm. for me personally, with my angel investing, I only invest in companies with female founders and diverse founders. Like I won't even look at a deal if, if it doesn't have that. I mean, listen, there are a mm -hmm. lot of great companies that I'm probably missing out on because of it, but um, there's a lot of people that will give money to non-diverse founders. Mm -hmm. They don't need my money. I feel like every time that I invest in a company, I, I, I am a little bit moving the world towards the, the place that I wanna see. And so first of all, I'd encourage everyone to have your own thesis like that, mm -hmm. you know, instead yeah. of going into it thinking, you know, how am I going to make money and what just really think about how you want the world to be different 10, 15 years from now and how you can start investing in the way you mm -hmm. want that world to look. Because I think for me, that has been hands down the most rewarding part of being an investor. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I think, again, it's just really, really great to hear you express all of those things because I think women of color naturally are at this disadvantage. And as someone who is hoping to learn a lot from Republic when I join full time and hopefully be a founder at some point in my future, it's really heartening to know that there are people who are taking this into account and really want to see a change in this industry. And so again, kind of shifting gears to focus really specifically on Republic now as an investor in Republic's most recent round, what has your experience been like investing on the platform? And what do you think the future of democratized private investing is going to look like? Yes. And by the way, you're getting a lot of love in the chat right now for your moderating. And I agree, you are killing it. You're like by far one of the best like people I've ever had a Q&A with. So you're <laughs> great, great future here. Um, I love Republic. I love anything that democratizes access to, to things that were previously only held by a very closed community. Um, when I first got into angel investing, it felt very daunting. It was over a decade ago and you basically had to write a $25,000 check to get involved in a company, um, which was very scary because I, I, I'm, I've always been a fan of diversifying my portfolio. I don't wanna just put you know, huge chunks of money into one company at a time, but that, that was the only way to get involved in investing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm basically, I made every mistake in the book. I, I would invest in like two companies at a time. And we all know when you only invest in one or two things, like nothing happens, you need a portfolio. Um, but I just, I didn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to be putting into a, a portfolio of companies. And so I kind of went away from angel investing and I thought, well, it's, that's not for me. It's just, you know, for people who have a lot, lot more money to throw around, um, and, uh, that, I mean, that's, I, I started getting back into it more over the years. I've put together mm -hmm. syndicates of people who will invest together. I've, I've had to get very creative, but that's what I love about Republic. I mean, the fact that anyone with any budget can invest in a whole portfolio and start their journey of angel investing for, you know, a hundred dollars into a company, I think mm -hmm. is so exciting. The best way to learn anything in life is to put your own money into it and have skin in the game. Um, my my 10 year old was asking me all about Bitcoin for months and months. And finally, I told him to put like his holiday money from his grandparents, like invest it into Bitcoin because like, I'm like, you're not going to learn about it unless you have some skin in the game. And now like we sit and we read the news together and we look at everything that's going on. And so I firmly believe that for anyone on this Zoom, who wants to learn about angel investing, you can read a ton, you can listen to podcasts, but the mm -hmm. best way to learn is to actually just put some money into it and, and see what's happening. And I love that on Republic, I mean, for a few hundred dollars, you could be invested in five companies tomorrow and, and see what they're doing. I, I think I personally invest in something like 15 or 16 companies through Republic already. Um, and uh, it, that's been, been really fun for me because I'm, I'm experimenting in new industries that I don't really know anything about and I wouldn't feel comfortable writing a bigger check into a company, but now I get to, to learn and experiment with new industries.
Yeah, I think you touched on exactly everything I love about Republic, and I know everyone really resonates with the mission that we have going forward. I've been really grateful and am really grateful to have asked you all these questions, but I do want to address some of the questions that the attendees have, and so I'm just going to go through the Q&A, uh, go through some of them until our time runs out. So um, Aditi is asking, hi, Randy, what's one piece of advice you wish you knew when getting started in startup investing? Oh gosh. Okay. Well, I I already mentioned the mistake that I made where the, where I only invested in two companies and then both of them like immediately went bankrupt and I just kind of I was like oh my gosh I just lost so much money and like I only put it into two companies and I kind of fled from angel investing for a few years so don't do that. Whatever you do in life, whether you're in the stock market, whether you're in crypto, if you're an angel, you need a portfolio. Like never in life go all in on one thing. Um, I think the other mistake that I made early on was I invested in industries that I didn't know very well. Mm -hmm. um, I invested in things that like other people thought that were cool um, mm -hmm. and were bringing to me. And I didn't really know the industry well enough to know if it was a good investment or how saturated it was. Um, mm -hmm. And so my first few investments were bad. I'm going to give you an example of my first awesome investment. And I'm sorry if this is like a product category that makes anyone squeamish on here. Um, but I'm a mom of three children. And um, after you have kids and your milk comes in, it is a horrific experience nursing mm -hmm. children. The technology, the products around it are horrific. There is no innovation for decades. And so I invested in a smart breast pump that was started by three young women uh, out of Stanford University. They found it impossible to raise money from any male VCs. They literally like wouldn't even take meetings with them. Um, but that angel investment crossed my plate and I said, you know what? I know this industry. I am in it right now. I'm ex I experienced the pain points. I understand the opportunity. I invested in it. And that was actually one of my best ever angel investment outcomes. So my advice um, would be to diversify your portfolio and to invest in things that you know, because if it's a problem for you, it is definitely a problem for millions of other people. Mm -hmm. For sure. I think that's such good advice um, and especially something I'm going to keep in mind, definitely taking notes during this too. But um, another question someone had and kind of on topic with the presentation Cheryl and I had put on earlier. Hey, Randy, how do you leverage industry experts to get smart on a new sector? Mm. Um, that's a great, great question. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm lucky as I, I now have... Um, Gosh, okay, let me backtrack this answer a few times, because to me, this answer also goes to my personal views on mentorship. Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone has always asked me my whole life, like, who's my mentor? As if, as if there's like one knight in shining armor in each of our lives that's going to guide us. I'm sorry, there's not. I don't believe that like any of us have that like one knight in shining armor. I've always found that my best mentors are my peers right around me that are mm -hmm. all starting off together and learning together, just like all of you on this Zoom. Like I promise all of you are your own best mentors in investing because maybe you're just starting off today, but 10 years from now, you guys are gonna be running the most powerful investment firms out there and you're all going to grow together. So I'm, I I'm feel lucky that you know a decade ago, I invested in several peer networks and really spent a lot of time getting to know people such that when an investment crosses my plate that I don't know about, I have mm -hmm. access to a whole peer network of people who know a lot about crypto or know a lot about mm -hmm. cannabis or know a lot about different spaces. And I guarantee that you guys will be that for one another. Yeah, I think that's such good advice. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, can I chime in on a question that I saw flying through the chat that I, that really like, so, so people were asking how I get access to deals. And I think I have a little bit of a different strategy than other mm -hmm. investors. Um, because my thought is that by a time, by the time a deal comes to me and mm -hmm. someone is pitching me, they've probably pitched 200 other people too. And so if they're coming to me, like that's not a deal I want. I want the deals that like I can't get into. Um, and so most of my deals actually are me uh, reaching out to the entrepreneur 
and forming a relationship with them. And like a lot of them are either sites that I've used that I love or products that I've bought that I love that I then reach out to the entrepreneur and I say, you know, I don't even know if you're open to an investment, but if you are, you know, let's have, let's have a chat, let's get on a zoom, let's get to know one another. Um, Mm -hmm. Because, you know, by the time someone's pitching you, like you're probably not the first person on their list. And so you have to wonder to yourself, why are they pitching me? Why have a (laughs) hundred other people passed? Um, And so for me, that's why I, I tend to like deals that I proactively go out and secure. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I feel like it must be such an effective means of sourcing because you're really then relying on your own perspective and your own thoughts on the company. So I I really like that. I feel like it's a very unique uh, take that I haven't heard before, but I feel like it must be extremely effective. You know, it's great because at the end of the day, um, you have to passionately believe in a product if you're going to go out there and support it. Um, And there are so many deals that I get in either industries that I don't understand or aren't Mm -hmm. a product that I would use. And by far the angel investments that I'm proudest of and that I feel like I go to bat for the entrepreneur the most are the ones where I've really experienced the site or the product myself and and can be Mm -hmm. a, a big advocate for it. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think this is a really interesting question someone asked in the Q&A. Um, how can we make pe- make sure people understand that investing in startups can be more impactful and help create businesses we want to see versus investing in stocks in the public markets where businesses tend to be stable and we are just buying or selling stocks from other investors? I thought that was a really interesting question. Yeah. And just to be clear, I do both of those things because I also believe you have to, you know, diversify your whole portfolio and your risk. So I actually, I, I have money in the stock market. I have money in municipal bonds that, you know, aren't really appreciating that much, but are also aren't going to go down. And then I have money that I put into risky things like early stage angel investing. So, um, uh, you know, I definitely don't want anyone to think like all my money is, is in yeah. early stage investing. I think it's very important to have a, a holistic strategy of, yeah. of your mm-hmm. personal wealth. Um, but you know, the angel investing is by far the most exciting. I, I like to think of myself as a patron of entrepreneurship, just like people might have, have been a patron of the arts a hundred years ago, or you're like, a, you know, you're, you, uh, there's one person in the opera that you've been a patron of or in art. Um, I like to think of myself as a patron of entrepreneurship. So when I go into angel investing, I kind of already assume that I've lost all my money because angel investing is very exciting, but very risky. And I want to say that. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to go into it, assuming that you'll never see a return, um, which is why the money that I put into angel investing, like I can really invest in my passion and really invest in um, opening doors for entrepreneurs that might have felt invisible, other words, mm-hmm. or investing in products that I really, truly want to get out there. And and then I guarantee if you do that, you actually will have a good financial outcome at some point down the road, but you have to go into it just purely in investing out of love and passion mm-hmm. in this space. Um, I love how Republic lets you see kind of um, a breakdown of how, you know, the different categories you're invested in of how much of your portfolio is diverse founders, how much Mm -hmm. of your portfolio is eco-friendly or commerce or this. And honestly, there have been a few times that I've surprised myself where I, I thought I was doing better than I was. And then I went and looked at the numbers and I was like, okay, nope, nope. I need, I need to to level set here. I need to, you know, um, I need to be better. And, um, that I think is, you know, I think not only should we be thinking that way, but we should all be holding ourselves accountable. So, you know, for a while, like I, I thought my portfolio was 80% diverse founders. I looked in, it was like 62%. I was like, okay, cool. Nope. Gotta, gotta rethink this strategy. So, um, I, I think, you know, that's, and sorry, I think I'm rambling to the point that I like lost track of the question that you're asking me. So <laughs> apologies. I get, I get excited. No, I think that's great because I feel like hearing someone of your like caliber and accomplishments, it's so great to even just hear you ramble and like absorb what you're saying. <laughs> Um, but I have a few questions that are a little more like tailor focused. One is any advice for female entrepreneurs who are still in college? Hmm. 
first of all, I think it's so exciting that like there's even the opportunity to have these discussions in college. Um, I tried to take several economics courses in college and mm -hmm. they were all like the theory of macroeconomics. Nobody talked about equity and angel investing and actual tangible things about finances to the point that when I got out to Silicon Valley working with my brother at Facebook, Mm -hmm. I knew nothing about equity. I knew nothing about early stage startups. And mm -hmm. I had to really work hard to not be taken advantage of um, because of how little I knew and understood in that space. So first of all, mm -hmm. I just, I want to congratulate everyone who's on this Zoom call for just, you know, taking steps towards your own financial freedom and knowledge mm -hmm. that way, which I wish I had done earlier in my life. Um, I also think that if I understood all of these things, I would have known that there are a lot of creative things you can negotiate for in life. Like I, I you know, was trained that like you can negotiate your salary and your mm -hmm. benefits and that's it. But when you know that you can negotiate for things like equity and different forms of, of equity and that you can exercise your stock options earlier than you buy them and things like that, suddenly that unlocks so much more potential for generational wealth than just thinking about salary and things like that. So I want to, uh, first of all, applaud everyone for, you know, for knowing these things and taking these steps, because I think it will help you not only in your investing journey, but in your own career to have that deep understanding of, of what is possible. For sure. I think that's such great and pertinent advice. I'm studying financial economics at Columbia and definitely feel the like macroeconomic stuff and that <laughs> not necessarily being helpful. Um, but I think a lot of these schools are revolutionizing. Columbia finally got its first undergrad venture capital class. And I honestly learned so much from that. And so definitely resonate with that answer. And just another question that's kind of like a short one, but I feel like would be really interesting to hear. What are you currently reading slash what's on your nightstand? Oh my gosh. Well, I have to say that because this year has been so challenging, um, having three kids who are, you know, now have been in homeschool for a whole year and trying to like hold it down. Um, I have to say that in my free time, I tend to listen to podcasts and read things that are not so on the educational level, I just need some freedom. So for example, like the number one podcast that's on my playlist right now is called Off Book. And it is um, two people who do a fully improvised Broadway musical every week. So they start talking <laughs> on the podcast, like they're just chit chatting about things. And then all of a sudden the <laughs> piano starts playing and they're like, oh crap, we have to do a one hour long musical about exactly this topic that we landed on. And, um, and it is just so fun. It's such a great escape, but it also really shows you like the, the uh, most capability of the human brain that these two people on the spot can improvise an entire musical with a plot line and songs <laughs> and things like that. So um, that's probably the number one thing. I've been spending a lot of time recently on the app Clubhouse, um, just trying to learn uh, from experts there about NFTs and uh, a lot of new interesting uh, investment vehicles there. So I, I've been really enjoying that platform. But um, yeah, I, I aspire to the point where I can get back to in my free time doing educational things. But right now, this year is kind of a little bit about surviving. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. And do you think we have time to maybe answer one more question? Absolutely. Okay, for sure. So Tiffany is asking for angel investing, would it be better to invest in a company that you can tangibly help through connections, resources, etc, or in a company that you are passionate about, but maybe have fewer tangible ways to help the founders? Hmm. So that's a great question. Um, and I think that really depends on your personal style. I love being really hands, hands on with the companies that I invest in. Um, mm -hmm. There are some investors that actually prefer to write a check and then back off. Like maybe you're, if you're really busy with other things that you're doing um, mm -hmm. and you don't have time to roll up your sleeves, that's totally okay. There are a lot of investors that like to just write a check and, and vanish. Um, I prefer to invest in slightly fewer companies that I can really mm -hmm. roll up my sleeves and get to work, which is why I tend to focus on industries that I know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think both are great strategies and I'm actually, I'm trying to do a little bit more of the other. So I, I'm trying to have a few companies that I'm really involved with 
but then also a portfolio of companies that uh, maybe I'm, I'm a little more passive, but it's allowing me to learn about a new industry. So I think there's, there's room for both. Okay, for sure. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know Cheryl and I were so glad and excited to kickstart this Amazing. with you all. Just <laughs> <laughs> the best way we could have <laughs> ever done this. And you probably saw all the love in the chat. I think people are just like raving about everything. Also on the Twitterverse, you're getting some love too. So um, thank you so, so much for being a part of this. You do not understand just how incredible you are to the world to republic to us and i think it really does show in the passion that you have and how you speak about these things and and zara you were an amazing moderator too so props to you this is probably her first time speaking you know in front of such a big crowd so um that was awesome to see and you just crushed it so thank you so much randy appreciate your time thank um you. Thank you both. And I have to say from, from all the great comments in the chat and everything, the future of investing is in great hands. So thank you. <laughs> Gonna cry now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, Randy can, can head out. I'm sure she has a lot of things to do. Uh, if you guys want to stick around, we're doing a quick little demo around Republic, just so that I know we had some questions around like how much can I invest? What can I do? So I'm actually just going to share my screen real quick. It's going to be very casual, but really it's more around um, understanding, yeah, how do you go about reading Republic, right? So you go on Republic, uh, just the website, right? Here you can already see who's investing in what. So, um, but you can also see how, like, you can go about Republic, or you can learn and follow featured investors that we have here, from Tim Draper to Millionaire to all these other amazing people. Um, you can see all of the funded deals and the types of startups that you want to invest in, or maybe real estate, maybe video games or crypto. So you can go and scroll down even further and figuring out what you want. But we're also just for the benefit of time, we're going to go um, into a sock, which actually does raise your full million. It says 100, 890,000 here. But when it's green, that means that they've reached the max, which means that they in a given year, um, you can raise up to 5 million, but they only wanted a million to start. So you can see here, you can listen to their video that they have. You can see which kind of categories they are a part of. Like, for example, if you want to look into more social impact uh, categories, you can. And by just clicking some of these tags, so you can kind of see which ones are available to invest in. But we'll go back. And at the same time, you can see there's only 11 hours left if you do wanna be on the wait list. You can click here. You can also see the which co-investors there are, right? So institutional ones. So we have 500 startups that have invested in them. Social Capital is a really uh, prominent VC firm in Palo Alto. And here's what I did wanna highlight is that these are deal terms. So essentially the valuation cap, so the maximum valuation in which your investment converts into equity shares and you can learn more there. There's a discount. So it's a trigger event in terms of, uh, there's a discount provision. So it gives investors equity shares, uh, you know, or to equal value in cash at a reduced price. You can also learn more about there. Um, a minimum investment, which is what you guys were asking about in the chat. You can invest, you know, as little as a hundred dollars and every single campaign has something different. The type of security, um, the SAFE stands for a simple agreement for future equity. Um, it, it came out of Y Combinator, but essentially uh, what it is, is, you know, it's an easy way for the company to roll up everyone into one line on the cap table. And their cap table just means the breakdown of equity, um, the shareholders that hold the equity in the company. Uh, the funding goal, as we said, you know, their funding goal was a million dollars. And so they've reached it, which is really exciting. And that's the that deadline that they have. So it ends tomorrow. Now, what I want to highlight here is that the pitch is all of this. And if you scroll down, you'll see there's all these different, um, you know, way, basically how they showcase their company. But what I think is also important is to take a look at the discussion section the update section and the review section, which is all easily accessible from here. The discussion section will just go all the way down to the bottom and you can actually ask questions directly to the founders. Let me repeat that. <laughs> you can actually, anyone around the world can go and ask questions to these founders that are 
you know, creating these amazing startups. And you can also, what's really cool is as an educational piece, you can go and learn about what other people are asking to these founders, you know? These are really great questions. Um, and, you know, when are you extending your campaign? Here, I understand motorcycle financing is looking like this, but, you know, it appears you you were, you know, down some. So how, how does this affect me, right? And you can kind of understand how do you um, take that and apply it to how you think about deals going forward. Then there's also an update section. So, you know, they've updated about five times. Um, you know, what to the investors that have already invested and potential interested parties. And last but not least, are reviews. So these are some of the reasons why people invested. So you can invest $100, which is minimum. Diego invested $5,000, and it really runs the gamut. And so um, what's really cool, too, is that you can kind of see who has invested and also what their profile is. And, you know, maybe they could you know, they might be aligned. They might have their investment thesis here and say like, I'm investing or sorry, like what their focus areas are. So like, hey, I'm investing in beauty and consumer. And so you can actually even connect with them here. So think about it like that. Um, hopefully that was a somewhat easy way of, um, of uh, looking at Republic. But if you have any questions around that, feel free to reach out to us, uh, Zara. We did put our Twitter. So if you want to... <laughs> ping us there too, that's fine. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, this is, I think, an incredible way to just get your feet wet, start, you know, looking at different companies. There's over a hundred right now that are on the platform. And so that is something where, uh, you know, you can be an expert in this <laughs> very fast. If you join our master classes, um, right? This is one out of four. We have some incredible speakers coming up too. Some that are like just prominent VCs, some that actually, and you know, towards the end too, we'll have people who have been through it, through like a, a whole venture capital journey. And so you can really learn from them too. Um, and so, yeah, at the end, by the way, for anybody who, uh, you know, stays on for the five masterclasses, um, let us know. We will be tracking and we'll uh, be able to highlight you in a Medium article that we're going to be posting after all of the five uh, uh, masterclasses are, are over. So just want to keep that in mind, put a little uh, something there. We are actually afterwards, we're going to be sending up a follow up email uh, with some of the links that, you know, we've put in the chat. Um, and at the same time, a feedback form. So if you guys are interested in, you know, just <laughs> letting us know how this went, um, feel free to do so. Um, actually, yeah, maybe we can actually drop it, the, the follow-up link now if, if it's available. Um, but at the same time, uh, yeah, if you want to share with this with your friends, family, all of that, feel free to send the splash that. Um, and yeah, I think that should be good. I, I know we're running a little bit over time, although, yeah, we, do you have anything else to add, Zara? No, I think we're good for now. We're really excited to kick off the rest of the series. We're going to be covering valuation next week and have two really incredible speakers. So can't wait to see all of you there and feel free to tweet us your thoughts, tweet about the event, what you learned. And we are going to be sending a follow-up email as Cheryl mentioned with everything else you can look at regarding Republic and this session. Yeah. So if anything, once again, feel free to follow us on Twitter. Um, Zara, drop your, drop your Twitter and if anything, um, yeah, that's, that's my Twitter guys. Uh, and if you have anything else, please let us know for adventure fellows and associates, uh, Zara has your zoom link in the calendar invite. So we're going to have a brief discussion about all of this afterwards. And it'll be really exciting to, to kind of see you guys there. So, um, thank you so much once again, guys, uh, have a wonderful day. This was great. <laughs> Bye, everyone.